Um, I hope you all remember the definition of the derivative. Um, it's something like if I do derivative with respect to A of some language, this is defined to be all strings X such that AX is in the language. Um, the idea is you look for all of the strings in your language which started with A and you take the A away from it and you just give me what's left over. And strings which didn't start with A, they just get thrown away entirely. So I would say, I would describe this as it removes any initial uh, A from strings in L and then uh, totally discards any strings in L uh, not starting with A. That's how this works. That's the Zhuzovsky derivative. <clears throat> All right. Uh, and I just wanted to do a few examples uh, of, you know, just doing the derivative of a set and then talk about what this has to do with regular and non-regular languages. That was the sort of the, the point of the derivative, why we're talking about the derivative at all. But anyway, some, uh, some simple examples here. How about what is the derivative uh, with respect to A of AXB, where X is in AB star So that means all strings that start with A, and then they have some stuff, and then they end with a B. Anybody want to say? This is a fairly easy one, in my opinion. You take all the strings from this language, and you remove any initial A's. That's what the derivative does. Any thoughts? Yes. Just yeah, just x b, right? All of these strings begin with a. When you take the derivative, it removes the a from the beginning, and then you get whatever's left over. So this is just going to be x b, where x again x can be anything, All right? It used to be the strings which start with a and end with b. Now it's just the strings with end with b. You don't. You can start with whatever, right? Yeah, great. Uh, how about? Same, uh, same set, but the derivative with respect to b this time. So this derivative with respect to b will take any strings which started with b and remove the b at the beginning. And then it discards any strings which don't start with b. That's what, uh, that's what the derivative does. So what are we going to end up with uh, from this derivative? The empty set, yeah. Uh, everything in this set starts with A. When you take the derivative with respect to B, all of those strings will be thrown away entirely. And so this, you get the empty set. It's because of this, uh, you know, this part of the definition. Discards any strings. I was talking about the derivative with respect to A. This discards any strings not starting with A. In this case, I'm taking the derivative with respect to B, but none of these things start with B. And so they all get thrown away and you get the empty set. Yeah, uh, how about, I'm full of these. I got three more. Uh, how about hmm? derivative res with respect to A of, this one's a little weird, X, where X can be anything. This one's a little weird, but anyway, this is just all strings on A's and B's. And the ones which start with A, you throw the A away, and you give me what's left. The ones that start with B, you, you get rid of them entirely, because it's the derivative with respect to A. What set are you left with? Any ideas? Yeah. Can it be like x such that ax is an element of ab? And then say you copy off a. Yeah. Yes. What he said was actually I don't um, I don't totally like this answer. So I'm gonna uh, this is a, a preliminary. He said x such that ax is in a b star. Right. This is correct. Um, although for reasons I'll say. Uh, 
this isn't what I was going to say. Um, yeah, that's actually, that's just the definition of the derivative uh, with respect to a, right? It's this. So um, it's x such that ax is in what you started with. And that's, that's what he said here, x such that ax is in a, b star. What exactly strings are, is that? I think there's actually a, a better way to write this answer. What kind of strings are there that are of this format? Something such that a followed by that thing is, is any string. What does the x have to look like? Uh, like for example, is, um, is b a in this set? Can b a be the x? I think the answer is yes, uh, because BA is in here since uh, what, what the definition says, this is all strings such that A followed by that thing is, is any string. And that's definitely true of BA, right? Because A followed by BA is any string. So this is in here since A BA is in AB star. What kinds of strings are in there? Uh, I would say actually ev every string is in this set because it just says it's all the strings so that when you put an A on the front, you get, you get some string. But th that's true of everything, right? Uh, actually, every string is in this set. Um, all strings <coughs> on A, B star are in here. The definition of the set just says it's any string x such that ax is also a string, but that's, that's everything, right? So my conclusion is, uh, so this is like the, the more, uh, to me, better answer, although the, the, the blue one up there is not wrong, but this is actually just the same set again. I said this was a weird one. This is why. When you take the derivative of that set, you get the same thing again. This is like e to the x. It's not really like that, but um, you get the same set again. What kind of sense does this make? Well, you have to, you know, you can think about this directly. Rather than thinking through this business, which might be a little bit confusing, I would say just thinking this through directly. What is it? You start with any old string, and the question is, you take all of those strings, which could be anything, you take only the ones which start with A, and then throw the A let away. What are you, what remains? And the answer is, well, it still could be anything, right? If I had all the strings which could be anything, I consider only the ones which start with A, you throw the A away, what remains still could be any string. So that's, that's my reasoning for why this makes some kind of sense. It's a little weird. So the moral of the story is sometimes when you take the derivative, actually the set doesn't get smaller. You, you usually think of the derivative as killing part of the set, which, you know, usually that is what happens. The string gets shorter or you just destroy the whole set entirely. Um, sometimes, though, the derivative does not make the set smaller and it doesn't even make the strings uh, smaller. All right, uh, I got two more weird examples in the same vein. How about derivative with respect to a of all strings x such that x uses an even number of a's. x uses an even number of a's. What are you left with? Remember, you have to think about I consider these strings, x uses an even number of a's, think only of the ones of those which start with an a, and then throw that a away. What remains? Yeah? Just x with an odd number of a's. Yeah. What remains is all the x using an odd number of a's. This is a little weird because the derivative only deletes an a at the beginning. It doesn't delete some a like in the middle somewhere. But because we are only in this set, when I take the derivative, I only consider the parts of this set which actually do start with A, and then you throw that A away. What remains is, could be anything that has an odd number of A's. So this is X such that X uses an odd number of A's. A little strange in my opinion. 
because when you see, if you if you don't think too carefully about this, you might feel like we are deleting some a in the middle of the string, which we're not. We're only deleting a's at the beginning. All right. And I got one more. How about uh, the same set but derivative with respect to b? X uses an even number of A's. Again, you should think I am considering strings where it uses an even number of A's, but it starts with a B, and then I'm deleting the B from the beginning. And then what kind of a string are you left with? Is it the same thing? Yeah, that's right. Since you are considering only strings which started with a B, and then you delete that B, what remains still has an even number of A's, and otherwise it could be anything. So this is. Uh, the same set again, x such that x uses an even number of a's. So again, you took the derivative and you get the same set again. Actually, that is not uncommon, you know, in, uh, in calculus. Taking the derivative and getting the same answer basically only happens with e to the x, but uh, in, in this kind of derivative, you can, you can get the same answer by taking the derivative for many different types of sets. All right, these were the examples. Can we just talk uh, for maybe less than 10 minutes about what the point of the derivative is and what it has to do with regular versus non-regular languages? Uh, so um, I will refresh our memory by talking about a DFA. I'll call this M. Oops. Uh, this has five states. This is the same example we talked about last time, although I don't know if you care about that. So this state x is like a permanent failure state. Oops, sorry. I want another state down here. I'll call it y. Okay, and S is the starting state. Um, this is kind of a com complicated looking diagram, but it's really uh, fairly simple. What, what is the, the language of this DFA? In order to be accepted, you know, T is the only accepting state. So you start here, you must do A first, and then if you want to be accepted, you have to do B, 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 and sort of multiples of three Bs. So the, uh, the language which is accepted here is A times B cubed to the M. Although I don't really care about that, but that, that's what the language is um, for this DFA. You got to do A first, and then after that you can do uh, three Bs at a time. And any deviation from that pattern sends you to uh, X, which is a permanent rejection state. All right. Uh, and what does this have to do with derivatives? So I will remind you, you know, we talked about this briefly last time, that derivatives correspond to moving the start state. So if I move the start state to t, moving the start state to t changes the language to derivative with respect to a of l of m. So the original thing, uh, all the strings have to start with a, and then they do that thing with the b's. But if you move the um, starting state to t, they don't have to start with a anymore. And that's the same as taking the derivative of that language because you will have taken all the strings which originally did start with A and you removed the A from them. All right, so moving the start state changes the language. And you'll notice when I said moving the start state to T, it originally was S, but I changed it to T and that change goes through an arrow labeled with A. And the effect of that is to take the derivative with respect to A. Uh, similarly, moving the start state to X changes the language to derivative with respect to b. Because when I move this start state through the b arrow, it takes the derivative with respect to b. This is what the derivative has to do with anything, right? This is the relationship between the derivatives and the um, and DFAs. And what if I moved the starting state to, say, r? Moving the starting state to r, 
This involves, uh, on the diagram, going through an A and then through a B. So this is like taking the derivative with respect to A and then taking the derivative with respect to B. Uh, but this, you know, we have, we have also written it like this. Derivative with respect to AB of the language. All right. That means you remove AB from the beginning of all the strings, uh, or you throw them away if they didn't start with AB. All right. Uh, here's another thing that I would like to point out. I said moving the starting state to x changes it to this derivative, d with respect to b. That's because you go through a b arrow. But check it out. You can also get to x by going through two a arrows. All right. So actually, by the same reasoning, moving the start state to x will change the language by d, d, a, a, because that's here, here, rather than just going here. It's, it should be the same, though. In this, uh, in this DFA. So this is an interesting fact. I will say note. Moving to X makes the language, uh, it, it ma makes it this, D with respect to B. And also uh, with respect to AA, right? Just because those are just those are two different ways that you can end up at x, and they um, doing the derivative, thinking of it as going through the b edge, it it's going to have to be the same as if you think of it going through the a edge and the other a edge. So, uh, sort of for free and for no no apparently good reason, it is a fact that these two languages are equal. Even though this is there's no obvious uh, way to deduce that. I mean, you could, you, could, you could think it through if you know what the language is. Think about what would happen if I took the derivative with respect to b or with respect to aa. But just because of the way the diagram is written, those two languages must be equal. All right. Um, and this is the, uh, this is the big, uh, uh, how about this? Sorry, let me, can I say another thing? Uh, getting to t, you could either go through a or you could go through a, b, 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 right? So similarly, since, since both of these things end up at t, sorry, I keep on scrolling. To get to t, you could do derivative with respect to a, but this must be the same as the derivative with respect to ab cubed. Because both of those uh, paths, if you follow them through the diagram, they both end up at t. And in fact, if you want to be crazy about it, this also must be the same as derivative uh, with respect to AB to the sixth, because that's also a path through the original diagram, which lands you at, uh, at T, all right? So it turns out, actually, in this case, when you just think about taking all possible derivatives of this language, actually, many, many of them are equal to each other. Like the derivative with respect to B is actually the same as derivative with respect to AA. The derivative with respect to A is the same as this one and also this one and also some other ones. It, it just depends on how the paths can go inside the diagram. All right, so I'm going to say, hmm. um, nice ringtone, buddy. I always try to make fun of people's ringtones when, uh, when they go in class. Um, so, what I was saying, many different derivatives will be equal, right? Like, there's a bunch of uh, different derivatives which correspond to moving the start state to x, and all of them would be equal. That would be like b or aa, or even a, b, a, that would also be the same derivative, or even A, B, 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 A, right? That would also lend you at X. Uh, in fact, looking at this diagram, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb and say, actually, when you take the derivative of this language, there are only five possible answers that you could get as the sets, because the derivative corresponds to moving the start state around. You could move it to here. You could move it to here, or here, or here, or here. But that's only five different options, all right? In this case, um, 
Many different derivatives will be equal, can I just say, to uh, one of five different sets. That's because there are five states. And there's only, we're talking about moving the starting state somewhere else. There's only five places it could be. And e those are the only five answers that you could ever get by taking a derivative of, um, of the language, all right? That's because of the finite number of states. In this case, there are five states, all right? This is actually a super useful theorem. It says, um, if L is a regular language, that is, it is the language of a DFA or NFA or whatever, then L has only finitely many derivatives, right? There are many different ways you could take the derivative with respect to A, with respect to B, with respect to A, B, A, A, whatever. But there's only going to be finitely many different answers you can get. That's because the DFA has only finitely many states. And you can only move the starting state to so many other places, all right? If L is a regular language, then L has only finitely many derivatives. And uh, the more important version of this actually is the contrapositive. I hope you remember what the contrapositive is from your uh, discrete math class. Remember, uh, if the original thing is like P implies Q, the contrapositive is not Q implies not P. So that would be, you know, my two parts is this and this. It's the other way around, but you negate. So I'm going to say L has infinitely many derivatives if L has infinitely many derivatives. then L is not a regular language. And this is the general purpose way that we are going to show that something is not a regular language. You show that it has infinitely many different derivatives. This actually is not very hard to do. I'll just do one very quick example. So this is the favorite example. When someone asks you in the club, what's the simplest non-regular language? Your answer should be A to the N, B to the N. And why is that? It's because actually you can get infinitely many different answers of this by taking its derivatives. For example, the derivative with respect to A of that, you know, the original language has the same number of A's and B's. When I take the derivative with respect to A, it's going to be strings which have one less A than the B's. So a way to write that would be something like, I mean, just like that, right? These are strings where the number of A's is one less. Uh, but I could also take the derivative with respect to A squared of the same thing. This would be A and minus 2. That's the strings where the um, A's are two less, right? And those are different. The, the answers I get are different. Can I just say sort of dot, dot, dot? We get a different answer every time. Right? The second one there means the A's have two less than the B's. The next one, there would be three fewer A's than the B's, and so on. It's, it's going to be different every time. So my conclusion then, can I, can I call this L? Different answer every time. So L has infinitely many different derivatives. So L is not regular. All right. This is how we are always going to show that languages are not regular. Uh, any thoughts about that one? I think I would like to leave it at that. So this, this uh, kind of derivative stuff will not be on the test, although I might ask you simple uh, derivative questions similar to the ones that were on the homework uh, for today. And there's some more on this uh, sheet of review questions that I'm about to pass out. All right. Any, uh, so let's talk about the test. The test is going to be uh, on Friday. It will take up the whole class period. 
I mean, you'll have the whole class period to do it. You might finish early. Um, you should expect the questions to be similar to the quiz questions or the homework questions. I think, I hope you have a good idea of what, you know, what kind of things are going to be on it. Uh, everything, as far as the topics, it could include, you know, everything that we've done, um, apart from this, this stuff that we just did today. Uh, does anybody have any vague questions about it? I mean, my, my plan was, by way of sort of review, we got 25 minutes left. Uh, I have a bunch of sample questions. Actually, I just took um, a test that I gave last time I taught this class. Uh, it is for you now um, to practice with. Uh, the, I have also written up the answers, and there, I'm going to post the answers at our class website, like where the homework uh, assignments are. So um, maybe... Uh, you know, uh, my plan was just to pass this out, and then uh, I hope you can, you know, work on some of the problems. I'll walk around and see if you have any questions about anything. Does anybody have any, like, big questions for the good of the group? If not, feel free to ask me whatever you want as I'm walking around. I will be happy. Thank you. Oh, I, I kind of copy and pasted this from an old test, and I just realized it, it has a little, a little line for you to write your name at the top. You don't have to write your name at the top. 